Hi everybody, this is David Paul with Eric Kadaj from Energy Recovery Inc. We're going to be talking about energy recovery in RO units. It's about a 40 minute presentation. I'm just going to give a brief intro and then Eric is going to provide details of the ERI type of energy recovery device and then we'll have 15-20 minutes of Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, just type it into the question box. Now this presentation is being recorded, so uh, after tomorrow you'll be able to go to our website and you or anyone else can view this webinar. We'll also send you a thank you email tomorrow which will include a PDF of this presentation so you won't have to take a lot of notes. So just so that you're aware, ERI and DHP do not have a financial relationship and we're just presenting this webinar to our clients and ERI clients uh, because we think it's valuable information that you would be interested in. I've been in the industry for a long time and been in hundreds of plants around the world including uh, the largest seawater RO units in the US and the world. I have a Master's of Science degree in Microbiology. Eric Kadaj is with ERI. He has 17 years experience in desalination and over 10 years in energy recovery devi devices and a Bachelor's of Science in Chemical Engineering. So I'm just going to give a real brief intro to energy recovery to set up Eric who will go into the details of the ERI a pressure exchanger. So as most of you are probably aware, power is the single biggest operating cost of an RO unit. So anything that we can do to reduce power is going to reduce the life cycle cost of RO. Now if we look at a seawater RO system, and it can be over a thousand PSI, over 70 bar of pressure to force that water through the membrane. Well, when you look at the concentrate, you know, there's very little pressure drop. If we had to send all that energy to drain, we wouldn't have seawater RO. So energy recovery is where recovering the pressure, the energy of the reject, brine, or concentrate stream, and we're helping, we're using that energy to help pressurize the feed. There are three general categories. There's the Pelton wheel, the turbocharger, and positive displacement. With the Pelton wheel, the concentrate energy actually helps turn the RO unit's high pressure pump. Here's a picture, you see these fins, well this shaft here is coupled uh, in various ways to go to the impeller of the high pressure pump. So the concentrate brine or reject, whatever you want to call it, then pushes against these fins which then helps turn the high pressure pump. Here's just a real small example, here's a clear housing where we can see the, the brine as it's uh, exiting. We have the reject pipes, that's the, uh, the piping where the fins, uh, the reject is going against the fins and turning the shaft and then the reject then goes to drain, goes to atmosphere. With turbochargers and positive displacement, the ERDs, the energy recovery devices, take the concentrate energy to boost the RO feed water pressure, but it's not coupled directly to the high pressure pump. So with the turbocharger, you have a dual pump that has a, uh, two impellers on the same shaft. So here's the turbocharger. The concentrate is coming and, and turning the impeller of the uh, concentrate side which is, since it's connected to the impeller of the feed water, is boosting the pressure to the RO system. So here's a picture, an example of a turbocharger, a big one. And then from ERI, here's an example at 10 cents per kilowatt hour of what you might save with a small, medium, and large system. And we can see that a significant amount of savings. So again, this is going to be in the PDF that you receive tomorrow, so you don't need to worry about copying this down, but uh, for an excellent animation of the turbocharger, you can go to that website. For positive displacement, 
the low pressure seed water goes to a high pressure pump which then goes to the RO membrane the high pressure reject which is just a little less pressure than on the uh, feed side then goes to some form of exchanging the uh, energy from the concentrate side to the feed side in this case we're starting out just to understand the concept uh, with a piston and so that piston uh, with the higher pressure on the right hand side in this example the concentrate is going to push that piston to the left the low pressure seawater is going to go to a booster pump since this pressure on the concentrate is a little lower than the pressure on the feet we need a booster pump so we can get that pressure uh, back up to the uh, feed pressure so now again this isn't exactly the way it works but real simply we have four valves when these two bottom valves are open then since the the reject here is this is atmosphere this is going to drain then the low pressure seawater has a higher pressure than basically the zero um, pressure of of the uh, waste stream here so the seawater is going to push from left to right so the piston is going to fill with low pressure seawater the brine is going to be dumped to drain and then when these two valves open then the high pre pressure reject is going to take that low pressure seawater and is going to force it into the feed side so relatively simple system uh, and very effective so for positive displacement the one that I just showed you with the piston that's the uh, flow serve which is Calder or Dweer system energy recovery has a similar um, but similar concept but quite different and uh, if you want to see an excellent video of the flow serve ERD then there is a YouTube address that you can go to so I'm not going to go into any detail on the energy recovery I'm just going to introduce it because Eric's going to take over so they have a positive displacement but it's called a pressure exchanger but the uniqueness or one of the uniqueness is that the uh, channels are rotating not going back and forth and there are no pistons so here's a picture of what Eric's going to be talking about for an excellent animation you can go to this web address so now I'm going to turn it over to Eric and he will go into the details of the pressure exchanger okay thanks David uh, hello everyone thank you for uh, joining our uh, webinar today uh, as David said um, we're going to get into the different types of uh, energy recovery devices and then how uh, each one is implemented in both seawater uh, and brackish water or two-stage RO systems <clears throat> so we'll start with the, uh, the seawater systems um, I'm just going to kind of rehash a little bit what uh, what David uh, spoke about in, in, uh, in his introduction um, this is a traditional um, seawater RO or single stage uh, membrane system uh, with no energy recovery device uh, where you have the high pressure pump providing the full flow and the full pressure uh, required uh, to the membrane system and then uh, in the brine line uh, you have the traditional concentrate control valve which is used to both control recovery and then also to uh, throttle the pressure um, of the brine so that it can be disposed of uh, to wherever the, the, the final disposal destination is. <clears throat> uh, the Pelton wheel, uh, this is just a different uh, graphical representation of, uh, of how the Pelton wheel works. It's also sometimes called a Pelton turbine. Um, <clears throat> and as David said, uh, you have the brine that comes in, uh, energizes the turbine, um, through the through the cups uh, as shown here uh, and the the most typical application of this in RO systems is uh, the Pelton turbine will be uh, directly connected to uh, a dual shafted motor uh, and then on the other side of the motor you have the uh, the main high pressure pump um, <clears throat> both the motor uh, and the high pressure pump in a Pelton system um, are required to be sized for full flow and full pressure 
uh, and then when the turbine is is activated or energized, uh, it spins the motor shaft uh, so that you, you you do not require the, the the full amount of energy that would normally be required without the Pelton wheel. Uh, but everything is coupled together, <clears throat> so everything must be on the same um, same plinth or the same platform, uh, and everything must be coupled. Um, and, and aligned uh, to each other. Uh, the other um, part of the of the Pelton turbine is after the brine float goes through the Pelton turbine, uh, you don't need the concentrate control valve anymore, uh, <clears throat> but you do need some kind of pump, uh, a sump pump of, of sorts, because after the turbine after the brine flow goes through the turbine, um, it uh, is basically dropped to atmospheric pressure, so it you have to have a, a, some type of uh, sump pump to pump it to uh, wherever its final destination is. <clears throat> uh, on the for the uh, for the turbocharger, um, as David said, um, it it decouples the energy recovery device from the from the main high pressure pump. Uh, so you have a device, the turbocharger, which has a turbine impeller. Um, same general concept as the Pelton turbine, just much smaller, because the turbocharger device is a freewheeling device. And what that means is that uh, it is not restricted to um, normal synchronous speeds uh, of, of standard motors, that being 3600 or, or 3000 RPM or anywhere in between there. Uh, many times the turbochargers operate above 10,000 RPM even sometimes 20 to 30,000 RPM depending on the size. Typically the smaller the, the turbocharger, the higher the speed uh, of its internal rotating assembly. <clears throat> that, ro uh, that turbine impeller is directly uh, coupled to the pump impeller, which is on the feed side, um, <clears throat> feed side of the, of the system. Uh, there, there isn't a physical coupling as you would think of it in, in, a, in a pump though. Uh, it's, it's, it's a one piece or sometimes a two-piece uh, rotating assembly. <clears throat> so there's no uh, alignment or anything uh, of that sort in, inside the turbocharger. Um, but that uh, hydraulic energy is converted into mechanical energy through the turbine, turbine side, and then uh, from mechanical energy to hydraulic energy uh, on, the, on the pump side. Uh, similarly to the, the Pelton wheel, there is no concentrate control valve that is required. Uh, because the turbine side uh, of the turbocharger will act as that uh, resistive uh, force and, and uh, impose the back pressure on the system. The high pressure pump uh, is sized for full flow and partial pressure, as you can see in this, this example. Uh, the high pressure pump uh, is pumping 500 gallons a minute uh, and producing about 565 psi of head, and then the turbocharger is uh, is taking that 500 GPM and pressurizing it to uh, 920 PSI uh, total uh, membrane pressure. Uh, I like to uh, explain um, how a turbocharger fits in a system um, as if it is a second high pressure pump in series with the, the main high pressure pump. So if you didn't have a turbocharger uh, and for some reason you, you, you put two pumps in series, you're essentially doing the same thing, the, 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 the large difference being that uh, there's no energy input needed for that second, uh, second high-pressure pump. So it, it, a turbocharger is essentially a pump where the motor is replaced by a, tur a turbine impeller. Uh, for the PX or the, the, the pressure exchanger, um, what you have is you have the uh, the main feed flow coming in the 500 gallons a minute uh, is split uh, between the high pressure pump and the, the PX. Uh, the high pressure pump uh, with a, in a PX system uh, only processes uh, the, the flow equivalent to the permeate, uh, and then the rest of the flow, which would be equivalent to the the concentrate or the brine, is processed by the PX. Uh, inside the PX, um, you have uh, rotating flow channels, as, as David said. Uh, there are no physical pistons inside the, uh, the PX itself. Um, there is a hydraulic piston, if you will. So the, the two fluids come into contact with each other, uh, but the exchange of pressure is done 
uh, when the lower pressure uh, feed flow comes into direct hydraulic contact with the high pressure brine flow and that high pressure brine flow uh, transfers its energy uh, to the to the feed flow and then that is what comes out into the circulation pump uh, and then back it rejoins the uh, the feed stream after the uh, the high pressure pump uh, the circulation pump typically uh, produces about two to three bar, depending on the, the, the characteristics of the membrane system, the piping. Uh, there isn't uh, much of a, of, of a, of a drop in pressure uh, across the PX, typically less than one bar. Um, and then that, that exchange repeats itself over and over and over again. There are multiple channels uh, inside the PX, and when you uh, go to that, uh, that YouTube video, um, you'll be able to visualize it much better. It's difficult to, to, to describe it without actually uh, showing, uh, <clears throat> showing the animation. But the bottom line is that um, instead of the high pressure pump having to process the full flow and the full pressure, now it only has to process, in this case, 40% of the total, <clears throat> total flow, but it does process the, the entire pressure. So the size of the, the high pressure pump can, can be decreased typically, and then of course, the, the, the motor is, is decreased as well. The offsetting um, circulation pump uh, that we're talking about in, in medium systems, you would be talking about a, a 20 to 30 horsepower pump on the circulation, 20 to 30 horsepower motor, excuse me, on the circulation pump versus 6 to 700 horsepower um, on, on, the, on the main high pressure pump. So while it's not insignificant, uh, the, the energy uh, required for the, for the circulation pump, it's certainly much lower than the, the reduction uh, in, in the main high pressure pump. Similarly, as I, as I discussed with the, with the, the turbocharger, um, you can think of the PX as a second pump in parallel, where again, um, the PX um, is handling the 300 gallons a minute of the total 500 gallons a minute and pressurizing it uh, to the full 920 psi and then the two streams out of each pump join together and uh, and go through the, uh, the the membrane system this is a uh, simplified uh, efficiency curve uh, chart uh, for each of the, the three main uh, types of uh, devices uh, that we're going to be discussing. For the isobaric uh, devices, the efficiency curve is generally flat. Uh, for PXs, uh, typical efficiencies run around 96 to 96 and a half percent across the entire range uh, of, of flows. Um, as is with any centrifugal device, whether it be a pump, a turbine, or um, uh, an energy recovery device, uh, you have a curve uh, for the centrifugal devices and as uh, capacity or flow increases then you have the efficiency increases increasing as well. Uh, because the turbocharger is a is a is a coupled device uh, and separate from the the high pressure pump and is free to operate at any speed, uh, its efficiency is, to, is is higher than than the Pelton turbine. Uh, the Pelton turbine efficiency that we're showing here is the, the turbine plus the motor plus the high pressure pump efficiency all rolled into one because you many times you'll see uh, a Pelton turbine that says 92% efficiency and you'll see a turbocharger that's 80% efficiency uh, and people will say wow the, the Pelton wheel is, is, is much more efficient. The, the Pelton wheel is only one half of the total efficiency that you must consider uh, for the for the the unit as, as, as you can think about it. So um, just keep that in mind uh, when you're evaluating efficiencies. This is an exploded view of the uh, AT turbocharger uh, that we manufacture at ERI, uh, just showing the, the main components uh, inside the, the turbocharger. So the heart of the, of the turbocharger is the rotating assembly in the center there. Um, and on the left hand side you can see the turbine impeller, uh, you can see the common shaft in between, there's a small um, center bearing uh, or journal bearing uh, 
that uh, that keeps the shaft uh, floating properly. And then on the right hand side you have the pump impeller. Um, both sides uh, of of the turbocharger uh, have a volute, like uh, just as as most uh, single stage pumps do. Um, <clears throat> in in our case, uh, we have a uh, a patented technology um, where the volutes are removable and customizable, and and, and can be changed at at any time. Um, some other turbochargers um, have volutes as well, but they're machined into the steel casing uh, of the turbocharger. So changing uh, that uh, that characteristic would be uh, extremely difficult uh, to to accomplish. Um, and we'll get into why that's important here in a, here in a second. Um, <clears throat> the other two bearings inside the turbocharger, there is a pump side bearing, which uh, is not shown here. Uh, it's simply a, another journal bearing for support. And then the, the main uh, thrust bearing uh, on the left-hand side that the face of the uh, turbine impeller uh, that that runs up against um, is what takes all of the uh, thrust force inside the turbocharger. So there is no, uh, there's no grease there's no oil bearings inside the turbocharger. Everything operates on the uh, on the fluid that's inside the turbocharger, including the thrust bearing. Uh, there's a groove um, either on the thrust bearing face or uh, on the uh, turbine side face um, that establishes a, uh, a hydrodynamic um, bearing, um, where as you squeeze that uh, that water down, even though water is almost incompressible. Uh, it can compress a very small amount. And then <clears throat> as the thrust goes towards the, the, the turbine side, um, you'll, you'll compress that fluid down uh, until it resists the, uh, that, that thrust force. Um, and that's what the, what the turbocharger operates on. Okay, um, so just quickly uh, about the volute insert technology. Um, it's important to 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 understand that uh, when a lot of these plants are are being built, the idea is that the plant will last for 20, 25, 30 years even. Uh, that's that's the plan or that's the goal uh, for the for for not only the turbocharger but the entire plant itself. Um, so every three, five, seven years, uh, typically the membranes need to be replaced. Some are some can last longer, some are shorter, but on average, we'll say five years. Um, and the, the, the membrane manufacturers are doing a very good job in improving the, the membrane technology, reducing the, the required net driving pressure, uh, and improving the, the flux uh, and the amount of permeate that you can get through the same square foot or square meter of, uh, of membrane area. Um, <clears throat> so in the early 2000s, say in the year 2000, uh, if you were to design a seawater system, uh, it would typically be about 35% recovery and an operating pressure of 74 bar. Today, uh, you're looking at 40 to 45%, uh, up to even 50% in some cases, uh, and an operating pressure that is 6 to 10 bar less than than what it was 15 years ago. Um, so if you think about a centrifugal device, um, every centrifugal device has a best efficiency point uh, at, at the peak of the curve. And at that at that certain speed. So if you designed a piece of rotating equipment in the year 2000, and you change out your membranes today, uh, you're going to be operating off of that best efficiency point because your both your flow and your pressure will change. Um, <clears throat> in some cases, operators are, are happy to 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 live with that. Uh, but if you want to maximize the efficiency and the performance of your energy recovery device, and again, this only applies to the turbochargers and the Pelton wheels, uh, the PXs don't have a, a curve. It's a, it's a it's a flat curve, if you want to think of it that way. Um, <clears throat> but if you operate off of that uh, off of that curve, then you can be losing efficiency. And what it looks like is is something something like this. This is this is an example um, uh, that 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 we've seen. Uh, so what you can see is that a 10% change in flow, whether it's due to Pressure, recovery, permeate flow, whatever whatever it is, um, if you put in new membranes, your your feed flow may 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 change the amount of flow you have to put in on the front end to get the same amount of permeate. Uh, so if you operate off of that 
the top of that curve, the green line, the best efficiency point, uh, you could be looking at, in this example, a 1.5% drop in efficiency, which doesn't seem like a lot. Um, we've seen cases where it's 2, 3, 4% drop in efficiency. It really depends on the characteristic of that curve uh, and how steep it is or how shallow it is around the points that you're going to be uh, moving, off, moving off from. The bottom line is that if you have a piece of equipment where the volute is, and, and, and the custom hydraulics are machined into the steel, then you can't really do much about that if you want to move that best efficiency point uh, in either direction. With the removable inserts that I showed previously, um, and the removable nozzle as well, you can reset the best efficiency point so that it is, that it is now in the new uh, feed flow that you require. So these, these inserts are made of a plastic material. They're very lightweight. They're very easy to remove and replace. Uh, they can be machined uh, relatively quickly. So if after five, 10 years, you decide that uh, you, you're going to replace your membrane and now you're operating off the best efficiency point, then you could have new volutes sent out to you uh, and get back to that, to that peak operating condition. So just a, a case study that we looked at, um, a 1.5% to 2% loss of efficiency can, can, be, can cost quite a bit in, 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 terms of, in terms of OPEX. In this example, it's 8,600 gallons a minute pump flow or feed flow to the membrane. Uh, <clears throat> the, the required head is 562 PSI. The best efficiency point uh, is 87, and we're operating 1.5% off of that with a cost of power of 12 cents per kilowatt hour. And the OPEX increase over 20 years is $1.1 million. So you can see very quickly that by replacing some very minor components inside of the turbocharger itself, uh, you can save yourself a you know, million dollars in this case, even if it's a hundred thousand dollars over the over the life of the over the life of the equipment. That far outweighs the cost of the uh, replaceable components. Okay, so we're going to move to two-stage design now, which is typically seen in brackish RO systems. There are some two-stage systems in, in seawater RO, but it's, it's far less common in seawater RO than it is in brackish water RO. And there are brackish RO systems that are three-stage. I've seen brackish systems that are four-stage. Um, and the turbocharger uh, and the energy recovery devices can still be used in, 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 the, in those systems in, in different configurations, but we're going to focus on uh, just a two-stage system right now. So let's take a look at the energy available for a seawater RO system and then compare it to brackish water RO. So for the seawater RO system, we can see here that the feed pressure is 900 PSI, membrane DP of 30 uh, and 40% recovery, and you have a concentrate energy ratio of about 58%, which means that about 58% of the concentrate energy is available uh, to, to the uh, energy recovery device. Um, and then you have a, about a three kilowatt hour per cubic meter um, specific energy consumption uh, for seawater RO. Now, if you compare that with brackish water RO, now you have 220 PSI because brackish water is always lower uh, in terms of required pressure than uh, seawater RO because of the TDS and the salinity of the, of the water is much less. Um, you always have, you, you typically have a higher recovery. So in seawater, we saw 40%, in brackish water, um, 70%, 75, 80%, even higher in some cases. Uh, so the concentrate energy ratio is much less, uh, there's much less energy available uh, for a brackish water system than there is in a seawater system. But there are still reasons, in addition to saving energy, um, where you would want to use uh, an energy recovery device uh, in a brackish RO system. So before we get into the ERDs, let's talk a little bit about flux uh, and flux balancing. Okay. So what is flux? Flux is the amount of permeate you can get through the membrane for the entire system. And there's two units, if you will, uh, of how flux is measured. There's the metric unit, which is LMH, or liters of permeate per square meter per hour. 
And then there's GFD, uh, which is more common in the U.S., which is gallons per square foot per day. Okay, so why would you want to balance the fluxes? So if you think about a two-stage system, if you have a much higher flux in the first stage than the second stage, then that means that your first stage is working a lot harder than the second stage. So what does that mean? It, it means that you're going to have a higher rate of fouling in the first stage than the second stage. You may have to re, uh, replace those membranes in the first stage than you would in the second stage. Uh, and it, it can complicate uh, your maintenance program uh, where you have to service the first stage in March and then you have to come out again in six months or three months and service the second stage instead of doing both the first stage and the second stage at the same time. So you have to send a crew out two different times instead of just one time. Um, you can also, it, it, it would also uh, improve the, it can improve the final permeate quality um, because you're getting more performance out of the last couple of membranes inside a, a pressure vessel uh, than you would if, if the fluxes are, 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 not ba are not balanced. And as, as the membrane manufacturers have, have told us, we've, we've spoken to all of them and they all agree that, that flux balancing is, is important and a lot of times it is ignored or discounted um, by, the, by, by operators and by engineers. Uh, they just are going to run the system and, and whatever happens, happens. Um, but they've seen in, in their testing and their experience that balancing the fluxes, balancing the following and the scaling and the replacement rate um, can, can all be improved uh, if you have a, a, a balanced system, not to mention the maintenance that, that, uh, that I discussed earlier. So there are a few ways to balance flux. Uh, the first, uh, and I, I guess the easiest uh, from, from an equipment st standpoint, uh, would be to install a valve on the permeate line from the, of the first stage. Uh, and this is called permeate throttling, permeate back pressure. Uh, what this does is if you, if you put a valve on the permeate line um, and you choke down on that valve, it imposes back pressure, added back pressure on the system, which will reduce the uh, it reduces the, the, the recovery, basically, of that, of that first stage and forces more water to the second stage. So that's one, uh, one way to, to balance, out the, balance out the fluxes. Uh, the second way is to boost the pressure in between the first stage and the second stage on, on, the, on the concentrate of the brine line. So the first stage brine uh, in a, in a two-stage system becomes the second stage feed flow. So if you boost that flow, uh, you will push more water to the second stage and you will reduce the amount of work that the, that the first stage can, can do. And you can, you can accomplish um, interstage boost a couple of ways. You can use just a pump by itself. Uh, you can use a turbocharger. Uh, or you can even use a, a PX in the system. And we're going to talk about each of those, uh, each of those three uh, scenarios here uh, next. So two-stage systems with with turbochargers. So we're going to go over quickly just a graphical representation of 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 the three cases that uh, I just spoke about. So this uh, this shows uh, a typical two-stage system with no permeate throttling and no uh, interstage boost. So this is case one or case A. You have uh, an average flux of 21.4 LMH. You have a first stage uh, of 23.8, a second stage of 16.5. So very unbalanced flux uh, in in this in this uh, in this case one. Uh, all of these numbers were taken directly from uh, one of the membrane manufacturers' um, uh, programs, uh, so that we were sure that we use real world um, numbers uh, for for each of these case studies. Uh, the feed pump pressure uh, is 9.9 .9 bar, and the feed pump power is 309 horsepower. So this is case one, no permeate throttling, no interstage boost. Case two, 
We're going to look at permeate throttling. Uh, as I said, you can have a permeate valve in first stage or sometimes both stages, uh, depending on the balance that you that you want that you want to have. Um, and typically, it's uh, some some type of control valve, um, not necessarily a ball valve because ball valves are not great for control. So it could be a globe valve or or any type of valve that gives you uh, proper flow control. So same uh, average flux, 21.4. Uh, but as you can see, the first stage flux now is 21.9, which has come down. And the second stage flux is 20.2, which has come up, uh, which is what we would expect. That's the goal. Uh, what you can see, though, is that now that you have introduced this back pressure on the permeate line, all of that back pressure has to be overcome by the, by the main feed pump. So now the feed pump has to produce 11.2 bar of pressure versus only 9.9 .9 bar of pressure before. And now the feed pump required power has gone up from 309 to 355. But we have accomplished our goal, which was to uh, balance the fluxes out, fluxes up uh, properly. Then case three, uh, what you have is uh, you have the, the turbocharger. And again, the turbocharger operates in the exact same way it does uh, in a seawater RO. The only difference being is that on the turbine side, you're taking brine from the second stage. And on the pump side, you're pressurizing the, the interstage uh, brine flow instead of the feed flow in a CURR system. But from a, from a functional standpoint, the, the turbocharger operates in the exact same way. Sometimes even similar models can be used in seawater uh, and, and brackish water, depending on the, the characteristics. So we'll take a look at the numbers. Uh, again, average flux is 21.4, same as before. First stage flux is 21.9, and the second stage flux is 20.2, exact same as uh, with permeate throttling. But what you see now is that the feed pump pressure has come down from 9.9 .9 to 9.2, and the feed pump power has come down from 309 to 280. And the reason why is that you are adding pressure on the, in, the, in the interstage line so that the front end pump now doesn't have to uh, overcome all of that extra work that the first stage is doing. We're offloading the first stage and that pump and onloading or loading the, the second stage using the turbocharger. Now this could be done as well with an interstage pump, but if you're going to use an interstage electric, a pump with an electric motor, then you're not really gaining all of the savings that you would uh, with the turbocharger because the turbocharger has a net energy increase on itself of zero. So we'll take a look at the summary here. Um, pump power, uh, as we discussed, uh, one of the uh, items that uh, a lot of people don't think about uh, is not only the operating cost but also the capital cost savings as well. So in the in the base design with with no permeate throttling or anything. You'd have a 350 horsepower motor in VFD with the turbocharger, only a 300 horsepower uh, motor in VFD. So that can be a significant savings on the on the capital side. Also, if there's if there's no turbocharger device, then you have to have some type of uh, concentrate control valve, uh, as you would in a standard system. Uh, with the turbocharger, you don't need that, uh, so there would be additional savings there, and the cost of that would vary from from uh, from plant to plant. Uh, permeate production is the same across the board. Um, flux is balanced in, 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 in the last two cases. The specific energy rate is the lowest in the uh, interstage turbo boost case, 10 per, uh, roughly 10% less than, than the base case, uh, and 20 to 30% less than, uh, than with uh, permeate throttling. So it's significant. Uh, annual power usage. Uh, is is much is much lower, uh, and then the power cost uh, you have uh, you can see it's it's eighteen thousand dollars less roughly uh, than uh, than the base case, and then a twenty year power cost uh, you're saving roughly three hundred and sixty thousand dollars over over the life of the plant, which would more than pay for uh, the the turbocharger um, multiple times over.
Now, two-stage systems, uh, two-stage system, two-stage modeling with an isobaric device. So just to just to just see how it's set up, it's set up a little bit differently. Um, the there's a the, the circulation pump or the booster pump is in between uh, stage one and two, and then you have the PX taking the brine from the second stage uh, and boosting uh, a, a portion of the feed stream back to the front end uh, of of the system before the first stage. Uh, so again, um, you you would have the uh, turbocharger. Uh, excuse me, the the PX. Uh, if if the overall recovery of the system is 70%, then uh, the final brine uh, would be 30% of the of the total feed flow, and then the the PX would be processing that amount of flow and fully pressurizing that amount of flow, which offloads the main high pressure pump of that uh, flow requirement in the same way that uh, that it does. Uh, in a, in a seawater RO system. Uh, this is a, a condensed p and ID. I apologize for for it being extremely small. Um, you'll be able to see it more clearly when you have uh, when you when you take a look at the at the PDFs. But essentially, it shows the same thing, uh, uh, where the PXs are offloading uh, the 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 high pressure pump, um, and then there's a valve, um, a control valve before. The flow from the PX rejoins the uh, flow on the first stage um, to that uh, to to the system, and what that valve does is, if the valve wasn't there, then the circulation pump uh, and and the PXs would would only be working to overcome the losses in the system, and you would not have as much flexibility in being able to change uh, the the recovery of of either stage and, and better control flux rates, what that valve does is it imposes uh, a back pressure <clears throat> which allows you the, to, to operate in the full range of the, of the circulation pump um, for whatever combination or, or flow or flows that, uh, that you might need uh, for that system. But at the end of the day, it accomplishes the same uh, goal of balancing fluxes while also reducing energy because it offloads the, uh, the high pressure pump. That's the uh, that's the end of uh, of, of uh, my portion of the of the presentation. Uh, so I'll turn it back over to David. Thank you, Eric. So it's now question and answer time. So uh, Daryl, the our guy who is running this, will be sending questions to Eric. Eric will read the question and then give his answer. Okay, uh, <clears throat> the first question is how to calculate the energy recovery unit size. Um, <clears throat> if we're talking about um, how do we know which, how do you know which model to use, uh, we have tools um, that we use that uh, would, will allow us to, to size, size it properly, uh, size either the turbocharger or the PX uh, properly for, for your application. Um, we have the, the PX tool is available um, on our website that you can download. Uh, the, the turbo tool is not yet available on the website, so you would need to contact the, your, your salesperson assigned to your area, uh, and then they can size that, uh, that equipment for you. How do we... Next question is how do we calculate the efficiency? Uh, so there's a couple of different. It depends on uh, on on the on the piece of equipment that you're that you're talking about. Um, I don't have any anything on on a slide that I can that I can show you. But essentially, um, to calculate the efficiency of a turbocharger, uh, you take the if if you're operating it in the field, you could take the actual boost that you're getting from the turbocharger, call it 500 psi, and then you divide that by the reject ratio, which is brine flow divided by feed flow, times the differential pressure across the turbine side. So that would be the brine pressure into the turbocharger minus the brine out of the turbocharger. So that um, that product um, would be 
the, the actual boost would be divided by that product of the reject ratio times the turbine side differential pressure. Does permeate throttling have any other backdrop other than higher energy costs? Um, other than, uh, you know, costing more to be, just the cost of the equipment itself, um, not really. Uh, if you, if there's a lot of permeate back pressure uh, above 50 to 75 PSI, then that may, it may change, it may require that you change your permeate piping uh, between the, the membrane and, and the valve itself. Uh, and then just the, the fact of, you know, if, if you have a valve, um, unless it's automated, which can cost more, if you have a valve um, out there, then someone has to go out there and, and, uh, and change the position uh, every time you want to change, uh, change uh, operating, operating conditions. AT turbocharger auxiliary valve function, okay. So, um, in a in a turbocharger, if you think about in, inside a turbocharger, on the turbine side, there's a a main or primary nozzle, which is what drops the pressure <clears throat> and uh, imposes the back pressure on the system. So it's a it's a fixed orifice, and if you if the if the orifice or the or the turbine side is designed for, say, a thousand gallons a minute and 1,000 PSI pressure drop across the turbine side. If you have a case where you still want to maintain that 1,000 gallons a minute, but now you, the, the pressure drop across it due to changes in the system is only 800 PSI, if you think about a fixed orifice or a, or a, a hole, uh, if, it's if it's designed to, so, such that you need 1,000 PSI to push 1,000 gallons a minute. If you only have 800 psi, then you can no longer push 1,000 gallons a minute through that through that orifice. So what the aux valve and aux line d does is it's a secondary flow path uh, in the turbo uh, on, on the turbine side of the turbocharger. And a lot of times people will look at the aux valve and the aux line on the turbocharger, and it, it looks like a bypass uh, if you just looked at it from the outside. It's it's actually not a bypass. It's it's just another fluid pathway uh, for that uh, brine flow. So under normal circumstances, that aux valve is closed. But if your pressure drops and you still want to get a thousand gallons a minute through there, you basically need a bigger hole, right? And because that uh, orifice is fixed, you can't just make it bigger. So what this aux valve and aux line does is it essentially increases the available nozzle area just by a, through a different flow path so that you can maintain that uh, that flow uh, at a lower pressure. What is the smallest size at which it is economical to, de to deploy energy recovery on brackish systems? Well, I mean, that it, it, it really depends on what your sensitivity to payback is. Um, we've spoken to some operators that say, you know, we're happy with a 10-year payback. Some that say it has to be two years, um, two years or or less. Um, it's it's not so much the the size of the equipment because the size of the equipment usually goes along with what your what your payback is. So if you spend ten thousand dollars on a small turbocharger and you're saving. Two thousand dollars a year, then your payback is five years. Similarly, if you, if it's a hundred thousand dollars for the turbocharger and you're saving twenty thousand uh, dollars a year, again, it's five. It's 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 all the, the payback period is the same amount of time. So it's it's more. The the better question to ask is is you know, what pressure, down to what pressure does does energy recovery make sense in broader terms? And we've seen cases where down to 80 psi even um, makes sense uh, for for an energy recovery device. We we des we've designed turbochargers that run as low as 40 gallons a minute. Um, but again, it, it's just just a matter of how sensitive you are to payback um, and how sensitive you are to upfront upfront capital 
capital cost. The smaller you go on a centrifugal piece, centrifugal piece of equipment, the lower the efficiency is, so the payback is going to be a little bit longer. Uh, but if you're not sensitive to to uh, a short payback period, then uh, then I I think it would still be worth your while. Additionally, um, uh, in, in brackish systems specifically, uh, you need to you take into account the the balancing of the fluxes, the the lower maintenance, all of those things um, to make the final decision. It's just it's not just as as simple as uh, as flow capacity. What is the manufacturing lead time of an AT turbocharger? Uh, again, this this depends on the size. Uh, some are available in as little as six weeks. The very largest ones can take 26 weeks. Um, it also depends on um, depends on shop workload and, and, and all these things. But typically, um, the, the, the shortest lead time is, is around six weeks. Uh, it can be moved uh, a little bit. Um, but uh, I would say that's probably the, the, the minimum that we can do. Is there a rule of thumb to know in which case to, to use the best device? Um, not really. Um, if typically, uh, since the PX is a higher efficiency device, as I said, 96, 97 percent, um, you know, the the most efficient turbochargers in, in in the water space are in the low 80s, uh, you know, 80 to 83 percent, something like that. Um, so typically, it comes down to what is the cost of power uh, in in the region, and this is this is more for seawater than than brackish water. Uh, but it still applies to, to to brackish water. So, in places where uh, cost of power is high, such as the Caribbean, where it's over 20 cents, sometimes over 30 cents, um, usually uh, customers uh, and OEMs and designers always go with the PX because of the the, the savings are just so dramatic um, because of the high efficiency. Um, and then other cases, you know, where the the cost of power is a little bit lower, then they'll then they'll look at the turbocharger because the turbocharger uh, for the same amount of flow, the turbocharger is 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 a less costly um, device than than the PX for the for the same flow rate. Um, it's not linear uh, by any means, um, but usually the 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 choice comes down to uh, cost of power. Uh, rule of thumb to estimate the overall noise in running more than one device. Uh, <clears throat> this would apply only to the PX. Um, the, the the highest capacity PX that we manufacture uh, handles 300 gallons a minute. Um, and then if you need, say, 900 gallons a minute, then you would just manifold three of these PXs together in the same way that you manifold um, pressure vessels for, for, for a membrane system. Uh, a turbocharger is a single unit, a single device, for every system, regardless of of what the capacity is. So, like I said, the smallest turbocharger we've built is <clears throat> 40 gallons a minute. The largest one that we built handles 9,000 gallons a minute. So, uh, with the turbocharger, you you don't have multiple devices where the the the, the noise can be compounded. Uh, for PXs, um, <clears throat> it's difficult to um, Isolate the the noise that the PX is 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 producing itself. Um, the the Q series of PXs that we that we manufacture have an individual um, noise level of 78 to 80 decibels. Uh, so if you put three of them next to each other, um, depending on where the walls are and where the adjacent piping is and and, and all of these things, um, you can measure what the what the combined noise is, but it's very difficult to have a single formula or or, or, or some type of, of equation that uh, where you can where you can nail down exactly um, what uh, what the noise level is going to be. We we have some we have some data and we have some some technical bulletins that uh, that uh, can be provided um, if 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 that's necessary.
Are all the wetted parts in the PX or other devices available in NSF-61 materials? The Q300, I believe, um, is fully NSF-61 uh, certified. Uh, the Q300 are the devices that are in the Carlsbad um, seawater RO plant, and I believe that was a requirement uh, for for that for that system. Um, the other devices. Um, Pelton wheels, turbochargers, um, none of those, to my knowledge, have have NSF 61 uh, certification. It would be only it would only be the Q 300 of the of the PX series. So why is the energy efficiency on the turbocharger higher as flow rate increases? So this is uh, typical of any centrifugal device. So if you have a pump, not a turbocharger, but just a pump that um, runs at 5,000 gallons a minute, its peak efficiency is going to be higher than a pump that runs at 50 gallons a minute. And the reason why is that there are internal losses um, in, a, in any piece of rotating equipment um, with the clearances between the bearings and the, and the, and the rotating assembly, um, the losses in, in the veins, uh, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> and what we try and do as manufacturers is we try to minimize those clearances uh, for the entire range of, of, of devices. So in a device with, uh, for 50 gallons a minute, you may have a clearance of, you know, five thousandths of an inch radially. But for the 5,000 gallon a minute, it might be 10 to 15 thousandths clearance radially. So, you know, you're, it's, a, it's a hundred times larger in terms of capacity but the clearance is only three times, um, three times, three times larger. So the losses, the relative losses uh, of the larger equipment to the to the smaller equipment, is is much less because the clearance has only gone up by 300% instead of 50, 5,000 percent, 50,000 uh, percent, what of 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 what the uh, of what the flow capacity is. So losses contribute much less. In the larger equipment than they do in the in the smaller equipment. At what pressures and flows does it start to make sense to use a PX over a turbocharger? Again, um, the the choice between a PX and a turbo isn't really um, it's not really a flow and pressure uh, choice as much as it is a, a cost of a cost of uh, cost of power choice. So, what we do um, since we manufacture both devices um, is if, if you send conditions, uh, plant conditions to your salesperson and, and say I want to compare the two, they'll, they'll send you what the PX will do and they'll send you what the, the turbo will do and then you can compare those, those two um, and, and make the choice from there. But there really isn't um, a pressure or a flow that, that, that makes that big of a difference. Since the PXs can be manifolded together, in theory there's an infinite they have infinite capacity because you can just add more PXs. Um, whereas with the turbocharger, as I said, the largest one we've ever built is 9,000 gallons a minute. Uh, so um, you would be limited by the size of the casing at, at that point. Okay, we have a couple of minutes left. Um, so it looks like we have a, quite a few more questions. Um, so I, I think what we'll do is I'll, I'll hand this back to, to, to David, um, and then we'll, we'll take those questions offline uh, and respond to those by, by email. Thank you, Eric. Um, just to wrap up, uh, for more information on anything to do with uh, water, high-tech water treatment training, please uh, contact us. Anything specific to the energy recovery uh, devices that ERI has, please contact Eric. So thank you so much for attending. As you exit, there are three polling questions. It's only going to take 10 or 30 seconds, just so that we can get some feedback on how you feel this webinar went today. So thank you so much, and we hope that you attend some of our future webinars. Bye-bye. <laughs>